Hey guys, this is hopefully a quick talk on derivatives of inverse functions. I'll try to do a couple of examples at the end, but first uh, let's try to understand what exactly is happening behind the scenes. So let's say we have some function f, and we know that it passes through two coordinates, a comma b. So this is the input, this is the output. So if we plug a into our function, the function will give us back b as the answer which is to say that f of a is equal to b. And again, a third way of saying this would be that the a value is the input for f and b is the output for f. Now, from this information, just from saying that f is a function and that it passes through a comma b, we should be able to figure out a couple of things. We should be able to find f of something. Now that something is either a or something is b. But pause the video and maybe fill in these blanks that I have in here. So think about what f would act on. What would you plug into f? Would it be a? Would it be b? Between the same two coordinates, what would you plug into f prime? What would you plug into f inverse? And lastly, what would you plug into f inverse prime of something? So hopefully you've had a chance to think about this. f of would have to be a, because a is the input for f, not b. a is the input for f. And similarly, if a is the input for f, it's the input for anything that's related to it as well. So f prime would be calculated at a as well, not b. Similarly, f inverse, the input for the inverse function is the output of the original function. So the output of f was b, that will be the input of f inverse. So this will be b. And if we do something with the inverse function, we have to use the same input. So even if we find the derivative of it, we still have to plug in b. We cannot plug in a into it. Here's yet another way to look at it. If you have Venn diagrams, this is the domain of f because a is an input for f. So this is the domain or all the inputs for f. This is the range of f because this is where the output of f is. So f takes this element a and maps it to b. a is the input, b is the output. Similarly, when we talk about the inverse function, the inverse function is acting on b, or it's mapping b back to a. So you can say that f acts on a, or f maps a to b. And later on in your lives, you might see uh, notation something like this. F inverse maps B to A. So this is often used in analysis or discrete math, but it means the same thing. A is being acted on F and it's taking A to B. B is being acted on by F inverse and it's taking B back to A. So let's say we have a function F of X equals X squared plus one and we're only caring about positive and zero values of x, so non-negative. We do this so that it's one-to-one. -one. Hopefully you remember that if a function is not one-to-one, -one, you cannot find the inverse. The inverse wouldn't be a function then. So if we have this function, we also can pick a random point. So let's say we know that this function f passes through the point five comma 26. I know that that happens because if I plug five into this function, f of five would be five squared, which is 25, plus the one which give us, gives us 26. So I know that this function will get, be guaranteed to pass through 5 comma 26. The input of f is 5. The output of f is 26. Now, if this is the output of f, it means that it will be the input for f inverse. Remember what we said here. b was the output for f but b is also the input for f inverse. So we have a function. We know that the function passes through a point. That's what we have so far as a setup. Now let's say what we want to do is we want to find the derivative of the inverse function. We are not given an inverse function. All we're given is a function and a point. But we're being asked to find the derivative of the inverse function at 26. Now, hopefully you understand why this is 26 and not five. F inverse has to act on the output of the original function. 
for the original function, I had given five as an input, and then the function squared it and added one to it and gave me 26 as the output. So anytime there's an inverse function involved, it has to do with the output of the original function, which happens to be 26. Now there's two ways to do it. I will do the long way first. The long way is if we are given f of x and we want to find the derivative of the inverse, well, maybe first we just find the inverse itself. So this is the age old procedure for finding the inverse, you swap out f of x for y. So you rewrite the equation as y equals x squared plus one, you swap the x's and the y's to find the inverse. So you get x is equal to y squared plus one. At this stage, we can subtract the one over to the other side and get y squared is equal to x minus one. Taking the square root of both sides, we get y is equal to the square root of x minus one. Now again, it can't be plus or minus because we restricted the domain earlier. So what we found by doing this is that the inverse function is square root of x minus one. Another way to write this would be to write x minus one, the quantity raised to the one half. The square root is just being rewritten as this. Just to remind us of what we're looking for, we are looking for the derivative of the inverse function at some point. What we have found is the inverse function. So what we can do with this is find the derivative of it. The derivative of x minus one to the one half can be found using the chain rule. So you bring down the power, subtract one while keeping the inside the same times the derivative of the inside, the derivative of x minus one is just one. This is the derivative of the inverse function. Now we can clean this up. This part is not necessary, but you'll see why I did it in a second. This can be rewritten as one over two. And then instead of writing this in the numerator with a negative exponent, I can make it move to the denominator and write it as x minus one raised to the one half. So here I just copied it again. So th this is continuing on here. I'm just copying my result again and saying, what, let's look back at what we need to find. We need to find the derivative of the inverse at a particular number. I have found the derivative of the inverse at any input, at any number. So how do I find the derivative of the inverse at 26? Well, I just plug it in. So one over two times, instead of x, I plug in a 26 minus one to the one half. 26 minus one is 25. Everything else stays the same. 25 to the one half is square root of 25, which is five. Two times five is 10. So you get one tenth as the answer. So there are a couple of things that needed to happen here. Number one, you needed to know what the function was in order to be able to find the inverse. And very soon I'm going to do an example where here, we aren't even given a function. We have no idea what this function is between x and g. So if you don't have a function, you certainly can't find its inverse. Uh, that's issue number one. Issue number two is assuming that the function is even given to you, you're assuming or it's assumed in this approach that you can find the inverse relatively quickly and painlessly which is not ever going to be a guarantee. You may or may not be able to do it all the time. So a lot had to go right in order for us to do this. Now let's see if we can use what we've learned in 3.3 to our advantage. So we're looking for an answer of 1 tenth, but hopefully with a lot less pain. Now we remember our formula that if we wanted to find the derivative of the inverse, at any x value, whatever you want to plug in into this function. The answer is the same as one over the derivative of f evaluated at the inverse of whatever this number is. So if we wanted to find the derivative of f inverse at 26, what I'm really asked to find is what is one over f prime of f inverse of 26? This seems very cumbersome, but let's think about what f inverse of 26 really means. Earlier we had that we have this x value five, 
and we have this y value 26, and f takes us to from 5 to 26. But f inverse brings us back. So if we start at negative 26 for f inverse, we go back to 5. So hopefully you understand why f inverse of 26 is just getting replaced with 5 here. Now, can we find f prime of 5? Notice that all we need to do is find the derivative of a function we were already given. In this approach, we first had to find the inverse function, then take the derivative of it. Here, we don't have to find a new function. We just use the one we are given. The function we were given was x squared plus 1. We just take the derivative of it. Derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. And then if you want to find the derivative of f at 5, all you do is plug in 5 for x. So 2 times 5 gives us 10. 10 will replace the f prime of 5. And there's our 1 tenth. Pause this video, go back, make sure you can convince yourself of every single argument I've made so far. So please, please, please pause the video, make sure you're taking notes. And if you haven't, maybe go back and take notes now. Convince yourself that this makes sense, that it is indeed a lot faster to just know this formula and say, I'm going to figure out what the inverse of this output value is, or what input value would give me this particular output value, replace it, find the derivative, plug in that number, and flip the answer. So ultimately, this is what we're really having to say. To find the derivative of the inverse at b, we can simply find f prime of a, because a was the input for f, b was the input for f prime, uh, f inverse, I'm sorry. All we have to do is flip this in order to get this as the answer. And this is going to be much, much, much shorter to do. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So let's say we have a function that is decreasing. Decreasing is one hidden way of saying that it's one to one, meaning you can find the inverse and nothing will break. So if a function is always going down, it has to be one to one. Similarly, they could have also said it's increasing, which means it's always going up, which means it's one to one as well. So here we're asked to determine dg inverse dx of one. So I'm going to translate this to say, this is really just saying find g inverse prime of one. I'm being asked to find the derivative so the derivative is the ddx part of a function named g inverse at 1. So this is what I have to find. And before I read anything else, I'm going to say that this will be the same as 1 over g prime of g inverse of 1. I know that that, that relationship is true. That's something you should memorize. Or I hope that you've memorized it so far. Next thing we need to figure out what g inverse of 1 is. You, you always start at the center and work your way out. So g inverse of 1, we have to look at our table. Remember that g inverse acts on the output of a function. So we're looking in the output column. And if it helps, uh, oftentimes students will say, oh, it helps me to draw the Venn diagram. So 0, 1, 3, 6 to 1, 0 goes to 6. 1 goes to 2, 3 goes to 1. And these are all with f. f inverse, or sorry, g. g inverse will go backwards. So g inverse of 1 means we're looking for an output value in this Venn diagram of 1. And where are we going back to? Well, we're going back to 3. So g inverse of 1 is going to get replaced with 3. So what we really have to find is what is g prime of 3? Look back at your table. G prime is given by this column. So G prime of 3 means I have to look here, and it is negative 3 over 4. So G prime of 3 is going to get replaced with negative 3 over 4. And then I can do a little keep change flip action. 1 times negative 4 thirds, which is negative 4 thirds. That's my answer.
Notice that I didn't even have G, so I couldn't find G inverse. There's no way for me to do that. We're just given a bunch of table of values. The hard part here is to remember that G inverse always acts on the output of the function, and it takes you back to what the original input would have been. So G inverse of one is really saying, look in the output, output column for one. Hey, it's right there. What's the input value that corresponds to it? Three. So replace this G inverse of one with three. And now the question comes down to, well, what is G prime of three then? G prime of three, well, there's a column or a data set corresponding to three. You'll look here, negative three fourth. That gets plugged in here. And then this is just arithmetic at that stage. Keep change flip gets you negative four thirds as the answer. Uh, one other thing I want to point out before I move on is I hope you notice that G, 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 my letters are consistent throughout. So I think I chose an example, uh, the, the very last one that I chose has different letters. The first thing I would recommend doing is making sure that all your letters are consistent throughout the problem. I'll explain what I mean by that once we get there. So here we're given that G of three is equal to negative 10. And again, I personally always just make a Venn diagram. Keeps me out of trouble. So I know that this will be G, this will be G inverse. So G acts on three and takes it to negative 10. G inverse acts on negative 10 and takes it back to three. We are also told that G prime of three is equal to negative eight. We might need that later. And we're asked to find G inverse prime of negative 10. So before I do anything, I'm going to write down what it is also equal to. It is equal to G prime of G inverse of negative 10. Notice all my letters are the same. I'm only dealing with one variable here, which is G. Now I think, what is G inverse of negative 10? Well, G inverse will act on the output of G. So I have a negative 10 here. And if I plug negative 10 into G inverse, I go back to three. So this problem really becomes finding one over G prime of three. And lo and behold, we were given G prime of three right here. We don't even have to look in a table. G prime of three is negative eight. So this would be one over negative eight. And that's really our answer, negative one eighth. Again, I, I'm choosing problems here on purpose where the functions are not even given to us. And without knowing this relationship, this one, you can't even solve this question because there's nothing to find the inverse of. So I, I hope that you're finding and, and recognizing and realizing that this really is much easier than first finding the inverse of the function, then differentiating it, and then plugging in the number. As opposed to figuring out what G inverse of negative 10 is, well, that's just three, and then plugging three into the derivative of G. In this case, we were given that information, so we didn't have to actually do any computations other than just plugging and chugging. The last, oh yeah, so this one I chose to say that this is where, quote unquote, the most amount of work has to be done because we're given the least amount of information. Also, notice that there are two variables here, f and g. So we're given f of x equals 2x over x minus 3, and we're told that g is the same as f inverse. I will ignore this. In fact, let me use a stronger color. I will ignore that. I don't want to get confused over g's and f's. So if the question gives you a function of f, change everything to something in terms of f. So when the question says find g prime of zero, in my head, I'm going to rewrite this question as saying find f inverse, because that's what g is, prime of zero. Again, g is the same as f inverse. So wherever I see a g in the problem, I can replace it with f inverse. So if I swap out this g for f inverse, isn't that the same as this? Find f inverse prime of zero? Now, if you understand that, hopefully you can plug in the formula now. The formula is, let me write it properly, f inverse prime of zero will be one over f prime of f inverse of zero. 
So now we need to find what f inverse of zero is. That, that is going to be our first thing. Or the first is make all the variables the same. Uh, well, make all the variables match. We're, we're not saying that we just have to magically make them the same. We want to make sure that if we're given a function of f, we're finding f inverse derivative. We're not finding g prime and sort of getting lost in the maze of what's the relationship between f and g. We, we want everything to be consistent all the way down the road. Once we've made the variables match, the next thing we want to do is find f prime, or sorry, not f prime, f inverse of whatever this number is in the denominator. So let's say, you know, some number x, whatever that is. Now remember, in order to find f prime, sorry, I keep saying prime, f inverse of x, we are being asked to find what input value would this output value give us. And the way you would do this process is set, or by setting f of x equal to whatever this x value is. So it sounds like I'm setting f of x equals x, but um, let's see, maybe I should change this to a letter b and then put a b here. And then finally, the third short step is find f prime of x and flip it. So let's actually do that right here to the side. Make all the variables match. We've done that. We've set it up perfectly. Now we need to find f inverse of 0. And the way we would do that is by setting the function equal to 0. So if I take my function 2x over x minus 3 equal to 0, I can multiply both sides by x minus 3. So you get 2x equals 0. Divide both sides by 2, and you get x equals 0. So what that means is that this function actually passes through the point 0 comma 0. This 0 is the one we just found. This 0 was given to us in the problem right here. Now, why is it that we didn't have to do this in the previous problem? Because in the previous problems, we were given the input value that gave us the corresponding output value. So in this question, we were given that. In this question, we were given far too much information, and we had to find out which part was relevant. So we had to look at the output value of 1, go to the input value of 3, and then from 3 say, hey, that's my derivative value. We're doing the exact same thing here. We're given an output value of this 0. We're coming up with an input value of this 0. And now we have to find the derivative. So I'll do that part third. f prime of x would require the use of quotient rule, because I have 2x over x minus 3. That's a quotient, or a rational function. So bottom, bottom is x minus 3 times the derivative of the top, which is 2 minus top 2x, times the derivative of the bottom, which is 1, all over bottom squared, which is x minus 3 the quantity squared. And now I need to plug in this 0. So f prime of 0 would be 0 minus 3 times 2 minus 2 times 0 times 1 over 0 minus 3, the quantity squared. 0 minus 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. And then 0 times this stuff on the top right would just be 0, so that's gone. Over negative 3 in the denominator squared would give us positive 9. So this would be negative 6 over 9, or negative 2 thirds. So we found f prime of 0. Now what we have to do is flip it. So my answer, I guess I'll write it here, f inverse prime of 0 would be negative 3 halves, because that's the reciprocal of negative 2 thirds. And that's it. Hopefully this makes a little more sense. I do want you to sit with it. If it doesn't make sense, please feel free to reach out and ask questions. That being said, there is absolutely no substitute for just sitting and doing and, and working through these problems. There, there really is no substitute for it. 
uh, I can try to explain this again, but I'm afraid I don't have another way of explaining it. I, I try to use Venn diagrams. I try to give you uh, a variety of examples and how to approach these things based on whether you're given a function or not, or if maybe you're given a table of values, or you're given an input and an output pair. Or in this case, we are not given an input, we were given an output, and we had to come up with our own input. The procedure is all the same, the information that's given to us might be different. So starting points might be different, but the destination has to be the same for all cases. Hope this helps. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day.